start. So um, I'd like to ask our counsel, Mr. Martin, to join us at the table. Um, and as we get started, just to review for the committee and for the room, so we have uh, recapitulated in miniature sort of the access we took process in the last week. There a lot of testimony uh, about energy efficiency modernization. Um, the week before, Jerry Fowler said the energy landscape. The idea is that based on what we've heard, uh, Goal is to move forward with the idea that uh, efficiency utilities in the state of could um, address increasingly in the next uh, period of time, three years is what's proposed in the bill, um, uh, emissions related to thermal and transportation. So they've been doing some thermal work, and then as we heard uh, sort of painfully uh, repeatedly last week, um, that the largest area of emissions is one they can unable to work in at all. So the idea is how can we change that story while also recognizing that there's a full proceeding underway at the PUC to deliver just such an all-fuels energy efficiency program, uh, a model for it and other answers uh, next year. So um, based on what we heard uh, last week, I asked you to draft this and now we'll get an introduction, work on it as a group this week, take some more testimony. And I hope by Friday, because it is quite uh, narrow and well defined, that we will be ready to vote out the committee bill. And just as a reminder for the committee, the committee bills go directly to the floor. So if you often notice, an infraction uh, doesn't get any further. So, so that's the. So is that uh, it, it just the process that's interesting to me? I didn't know. So it goes right to the floor. It doesn't go to another committee, unless it has something in there that was required to go to committee. You know, it's an interesting question. I'll have to go back to this. I can ask Secretary Bloomer. Just yeah. Yeah. So I checked with Secretary Bloomer generally, uh -huh. but I didn't ask him this. Had there been any appropriation of this, uh, maybe how long? Senate Rule 41 or whatever would cause an automatic referral, uh, which would make sense. but. Not yeah. or, right. And we're not dealing with um, taxes uh, or procedures correctly. So, with that, Mr. Hartland, thank you. If you could walk us through the draft one of the, oh, well, draft four of the committee bill. Thank you very much, Luke Martland, Director of Legislative Council and Chief Counsel of General Assembly. I was asked today to do a quick walkthrough of this two-page bill. It's based on the testimony from last week concerning Act 62. Uh, you have not seen it yet. So that's why I have draft watermark on it. And I'll walk through it. I won't read it line for line, but I'll try to paraphrase it for you. And as always, please interrupt if you have questions. Can I no? start with a quick question? <laughs> <laughs> You remind me, so what, what's the, in terms of making this an official committee bill, what's the uh, process there? What takes us from being a draft to having this be the first official committee bill draft? This, this one. I was just doing this because the members of the committee haven't seen it. And it is yeah, a yeah. draft four, which just means that the sponsor and I were working through different versions over the weekend. So I wanted to explain that. That's why I put the watermark on it. Sure. Obviously, the committee will take it up, discuss, modify it as they think appropriate, and then vote on whether they pass it out. Okay, great. So, thanks. I don't think I ever read the statement of purpose as introduced, but it's worthwhile taking a second to read it because that really summarizes the purpose of this bill before I go through the language. And what the bill tries to do is, for a limited period of time, three years, allow energy efficiency utilities to use a portion of their budgets on programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the thermal and transportation sectors. So let's now look at the language in the actual bill. First of all, you notice it's session law. It's not codified in the green books. Starting in line 14 on page one, it says notwithstanding any provision of law or order of the PUC to the contrary, for the calendar years, not fiscal years, but calendar years, 2021 through 23, an entity appointed by the PUC to provide electric energy efficiency and conservation programs and measures, and there's a cross-reference, this basically means the energy efficiency utilities, shall be authorized, so that's mandatory, shall be authorized by the PUC 
to spend a portion of its annual resource acquisition budget on programs, measures, and services that shall. So as I stressed on line 18, it shall be authorized by the PUC, and it states a portion but does not give a specific amount. Flipping to page two, here are the criteria. Number one, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the thermal energy or transportation sectors or both. In other words, one of the programs, measures, and services could be specific to thermal, specific to transportation, or somehow cover both. Number two, result in the largest possible greenhouse gas emissions reductions in a cost-effective manner. In other words, biggest bang for the buck. Number three, demonstrate a clear nexus with electricity usage, and four, be complementary to, and shall not replace or be in competition with, and this language basically means a tier three programs under the RES, so the so-called energy transformation programs. Are there any questions about what I've covered so far? Yes. How is clear defined? Because something that might be clear to me may not be clear to Clear is not defined clearly or unclearly. I mean, it, it's, you're right, it's common okay. sense. It's not a defined term, neither is nexus. Okay. So these are words that the committee could use different words, but it's a little bit of common sense. And remember, this is session law. We're not quite as exact in the drafting. Okay. So there, this, there's other words that are better time to go back to it. B, this is in essence a carve out that applies to Burlington Electric. Because remember, Burlington Electric is both a utility and a efficiency utility, a DU and an EU. Any funds spent on programs, measures, and services pursuant to this section by a retail electricity provider that the PUC has appointed an energy efficiency entity pursuant to, and there's a cross-reference, shall not be counted towards a calculation of funds used by that retail electricity provider for energy transformation programs. What this basically says is that, if you remember, there is under uh, 30 BSA 8005, there is language that um, the tier three programs, the energy transformation programs, shall cost the utility less than the applicable alternative compliance payment rate. And then later on in the same statute, there's actually numbers for the alternative compliance rates and the PUC has the ability to modify that. In essence, what this does is Burlington Electric's concern, I think as they voiced in the committee last week, was that if they're engaging in additional programs according to the session law, if you count the cost of those programs, it would put them above the alternative compliance rate and they would therefore be penalized. And this applies only to Brunswick Electric and prevents that. So that's really what this language does. Then finally, uh, section two, the effective date. The act shall take effect on passage and shall be repealed as of January 1st, 2024. If you remember, this applied to calendar years 2021 through 2023. In other words, December 2023 is repealed as of January 1st, 2024. And this language is perhaps a little redundant. It just makes it very clear that this is a time-limited three-year program. Are there any questions for me? Thank you. On um, line 18 on the first page, will shall be offered with the PUC to spend a portion of its own resources. Does that mean the PUC can set that portion, or will the? That's a good question. Um, I had read it as more that the programs would be suggested, and if they meet the criteria in page two, the PUC has to, shall approve them. Um, perhaps it could be read as PUC had a role in authorizing what portion, that maybe something the committee wants to discuss. So. Yeah, well, I, thank you. Thank you for that question. There are the portion. So <clears throat> conversations, uh, I worked on a draft bill in the summer and fall, but at one point laid out sort of an allocation formula. <clears throat> the more I learned about the process, the more I concluded that there's a lot of sophisticated analysis behind 
deciding what kind of measure ought to be funded or not. And we have the department working and all the stakeholders, the EDUs plus the DUs, all working in the, at the PUC to have these conversations. And I felt like, okay, so let's stick with the well-defined process we have that's got us so far, and we'll count on the PUC to figure out what the right proportions are. Because frankly, any member, Say just a little more. You know, at one point I said, well, what if we did 5149? I think, well, that, what, what sense does that make? So let's rely on the process to d deliver the uh, best definition of what portion. Um, the other thing is because of, um, I think based on what the PUC said last week, proposing to only use EEC dollars that originated in EV charging, I think was part of their proposal. Um, that generates something in the order of $120,000 worth of EEC money currently, or last year. That's such a small report, it seems to me like they're, they're not charging ahead. It's a big progressive way. They're offering a very modest step, so it makes me uh, feel as though they're going to take a cautious approach in determining what that portion is. And then thirdly, uh, I don't think, honestly, we could move too much money too quickly because there, there are capacity things. How do you find the programs? What kind of personnel delivers them? Do we already have those resources? So that the notion I have for myself, and we'll take testimony this week to flesh this out, is that we're asking, um, the analogy that comes to mind for me is almost all the weight in the, at the efficiency utilities is in the right, the right foot, meaning they're doing uh, traditional electrical energy efficiency work. Uh, talking about doing work in thermal and transportation is sort of like putting weight into your left foot. Well, how fast do you shift weight from one foot to the other, and, and what's the balance at the end? This seems like the kind of thing that will evolve and that to try to write it into statute will be um, a, a bit on the clunky side. Like, how will we know we have the right numbers? Why not work with expert, expert parties and stakeholders um, figure that out in person and uh, proceed? So that's why it says portion and doesn't name what the portion is. Is there a campaign? Uh, Mr. Chair, the three-year time period. So the, I thought, yeah, that was based on the report. Do you back? No. Right. Well, so that's based on right now. Uh, the energy efficiency utilities have filed for their next their next demand resource plans for the period 21, 22, 23. Right. And um, so it's matched to that next uh, you know, performance contract period. Thank you. Um, and the idea there was. Um, to define a period that made sense with the way they make their plans, get their budgets approved and all the rest, uh, provide some longevity so that people know they can move into this area, make investments without having a rug pulled out from underneath them only 12 months later or something like that, but not make it permanent so that we know that, yeah, we want to actively monitor this and participate in future years and um, make further adjustments. I hope to, to get to the true comprehensive fall fuels energy efficiency program that Act 62 contemplates. Thank you. Any other questions? About what this does or whether or not it's a good idea? About what it does, I can't comment on this good idea. So I'll be about the language of the so how would that be different from what happens <coughs> if we don't do this? Well, I'll let council answer because certain things prescribed. If you don't do this, my understanding is that there'd be, they could not use the money for the thermal and transportation sector, greenhouse gas and um, emissions programs and services. So it allows them to spend could, money on stuff could, they couldn't otherwise spend. Who couldn't use the money? The 
the energy efficiency utility. So, for example, if it's Superman or Burlington Electric. And when we were we to endorse this, um, how will, what will the money be used on? Well, there's criteria on page two, but beyond that, I couldn't comment. So the proposals would have to check all those boxes, but beyond that, I can't give you more specifics. So would the PUC decide in the interim what the money's used on? Well, the language is shall as opposed to may, so it says that basically if they come to the PUC with a proposal and it checks those four criteria or boxes on the top page two, the PUC shall approve. So it's um, not discretionary. It's discretionary. Mr. Chair, we, last year we broke our promise to uh, thank you. Pay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. To pay the pay this charge, and um, we did it with our eyes wide open, and we were straightforward about it. And we said it was going to last 18 months, and when the money was stolen fair and square, from my words, the pejorative words, from the usual places that it went. It was done with the understanding that it would be used to do things like uh, train people to get ready for the next step. It was used to um, move ahead in, uh, in this global warming stuff. And it was all the things that it's being used for for 18 months were stuff that's going to have to be done no matter what our solution is. Um, and it wasn't a risky thing. And, um, Can I check on that? So it has to be done. It, I think the where we made new monies available was in weatherization, right? So it was into that slot. So that has to be done. Uh, I agree. I mean, that's part of the overall number of things we we know we're going to take on. And simultaneously, we the transportation committee has been moving forward on trying to deal with the transportation side. Um, I'm, I'm perhaps prejudiced. I got my uh, concerns with the PUC that often comes in and doesn't tell us what they're going to do, and we ask them what they're going to do and what they're, how they're working on stuff, and then we go home and then we see the rules come out to do things that we didn't authorize, and we get kind of caught up in it. And, starts to make changes, etc. Um, we should be making the changes. And um, I think most of the most of the, us are in support of this. Uh, what's the name of it? The Global Solutions Planning Act, or whatever. I don't. What am I aware? Climate. Change. What's the climate? What's the, what's the buzz thing we're talking about? I, I sign on to the bill. What's the bill? And we should ask you. I guess I'm around the table what it's called. And uh, it, are you talking about Global Warming Solutions Act? Yes. You refer to upstairs, okay. Yeah. More. Um, and what that does is it sets a timetable that nothing really has to happen for two or three years. And at that point, it, it's going to take, you know, a vote of the legislature to make it happen. But we've established a council that votes on what the plans will be. And the council is, uh, that's our job to vote on what things should be. And not put that out to uh, people that aren't elected to do it and people whose interests are dictated by folks that live in other states and stockholders here and there. That it's about 22 or three people. We're putting it out to them to do something that's going to may or may not take place in three years. I'd like to know what we're doing now, other than authorizing the PUC to take money beyond the 18 months that we've taken it from the electric rate payer, so that they can continue to take the electric rate payer's money and use it as they see fit. Isn't that what this bill does? Yeah. So I, to respond to a couple things, so we'll have a fuller conversation at Global Warming Solutions if the House sends something to yeah. But I'll say right from the outset, I agree that there's a there are policy choices to be made on behalf of all Vermonters, and I think the 
around general assemblies, the place to make them, not necessarily a council of people who aren't elected. So, but we'll get to that one later. The, so, uh, to your point, I think what we're, what I'm hoping we're doing here, the goal is to find a policy that our energy efficiency utilities shall take on work in all three we'll, sectors. We, and then, uh, because uh, we're going to hire, what, what we're going to hire the efficiency for want to do in the future. Um, we hire them, we tell them what to do. And I assume they'll probably be the, the ones that get the bid to do this because of their experience and track record. But you know, well, who knows who yes. would get hired. Right. So that, so I, I want to keep these two threads separate. So for the final Act 62 report a year from now, it, it is very clear in there that if there may be new entities, existing entities, whatever, whoever, I don't know who would, who the participants in it, all fuels energy efficiency the program is. And it very specifically um, avoids the word utility. It says it's a program. Utilities will very likely participate, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily suggest that those who are already doing the work will do that program. In this case, we're saying before we can do that bigger <coughs> lift, let's take the current actors we already have working in the space and allow them to do more work. Um, and so that's where I'm my goal, to, to your point, is to keep the policy decision. Should the efficiency utility be able to work in one sector or three? Keep that in here, and we, we're the ones to say all three. I think it's an excellent draft, and it's put out before us some of the decisions we have to make, and, and um, I be in that spirit. And okay. Thank you for putting well, in context with the other moving parts that may yeah, not be is, going forward. We have a lot of pieces going at the same time. Um, the other thing is, so Luke, can you just, except Mr. Martin, can you explain, when we put something in a session log, uh, that's, because in, the, in this case, it's a three-year program, time limited. So is that the, the rationale for doing it there as opposed to putting it into the regular green books? And is there any legal distinction between the impact of using session law versus writing it into the green books? So session law is equally binding as opposed to codified law in the green books. They're both law, they're both binding. Neither has greater or lesser weight than the other. We put some provision in session law for time limited. Uh, if they won't last for a long period of time or permanently. So this is an example of a three-year, in essence, pilot project or a temporary project yeah. would be appropriate for session law. Um, I think just one other thing that I want to point out in terms of how this is set up is the criteria on page two, one through four, are handed so that um, you have to be able to check all four boxes. And those boxes were uh, making notes last week while we were going through stuff. Those were the things that I thought um, people speaking was <coughs> wanting to see. Whether these are well expressed yet or not, we'll figure out this week. My goal is that we check back in with uh, stakeholders hear about those criteria, make sure that we are clear to center and parents point, um, and that we're being, uh, I'd say, prescriptive enough at the policy level to maintain that responsibility, which is ours. But um, the reason that it's um, being sent to the PUC is that, again, you know, I've, from everything I saw, and previous proceedings and in Act 62 that it's the right form for taking in the amount of uh, complex data from different stakeholders and working it through um, to come up with uh, what kind of measure meets the four criteria. Um, and then again, back to portion, I figure that that too is the kind of analysis that um, we've seen the PUC do repeatedly in the past. So it tends to be a, a 
balance that I've done between maintaining policy responsibilities here and then implementation responsibilities uh, and analytical responsibilities located at the PUC. Um, do we have the right balance? I don't know. I don't know. I, when you play the game of paper, scissors, rock, what's the balance? Uh, when, well, what's that question translated to? Like, it is when you're me meeting the largest possible greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. paper, when you're doing it in a cost-effective manner that's the, you get the most greenhouse gases for whatever, that's scissors. And when it, there's a clear nexus for electricity, that's rock. Well, so you got a three-legged duck and two nails. So I would say these are all rocks. Four all right. rocks. We make those decisions, and we're giving them to POC, PUC for the next several years. And whatever they do. Is going to be what they think is best. After they have listened to the testimony from various lobbyists and special interests. Okay. That's our job. Once, once we have something in place that works in a certain way, we turn its future administration over to the PUC. That's our job. And, some t and when we turn things over to the PUC and say, do this, and you're interested in rocks, and I'm interested in scissors, and you're interested in paper, and they come out with what they come out with, that becomes the law. But Mr. Chair, we should do that. So that's my, I'm, this is my frustration with this policy. We put it off into the future, and then we give it away in statute to do things that the current statute does. Sorry. I'm wondering, does it matter what Senator McDonald's say? Only because really what the goal is is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the thermal and transportation sector. It's true. So who cares if it's rock, paper, scissors? If that's the goal and things are reduced, it doesn't make any real, to me, it doesn't make a difference. The fuel dealers, it makes a difference to them. Mm -hmm. The um, Automobile manufacturers makes a difference to them, although this is thermal. Um, it makes a, a lot of difference to a lot of people who need to come in and make their case. And they're going in to make their case to the PUC, an appointed board um, that wasn't appointed for this purpose. They're not coming in to make the case with us. And we're saying, you guys make the case in there where the you know, the PUC's rules for taking testimony, for doing a whole bunch of things. It's a, it's a, it's, we represent the citizenry on what we ought to do. And sometimes we send it to them once we've, we're clear on what ought to happen. Sometimes we ask them to recommend to us what ought to happen, and we endorse it. But in this case, we're saying we don't know what should happen. You guys write it and put it into law for the next three years while we mess around with the Thing, thing I can't remember, climate change, whatever initiative, and work that out. Boy, that's a free ride for 180 people. Well, it's so meeting a goal that's supposed to be. And so I'm, I came in this morning saying I was going to be relaxed this week. Yeah, just so far, so what be glad to say. Um, the, uh, so this is a great first. Yeah, I would, you know, if I may, another analogy, I would take it. If we're saying we want housing, we want it to be uh, adequately sized, we want it to be sanitary, we want it to be energy efficient, uh, we want it to be well located. So I've just listed four criteria for a housing project. The fact that I didn't choose adequately sized and throw all the other ones overboard, it, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not expressing policy. The fact that we have four criteria uh, to consider in making a decision doesn't, to me, suggest we've thrown our hands up. We're saying of the 50 things we could dream of, we've focused on four. And we're looking for a solution that can satisfy all four. So I don't see it as abdicating. I see it as specifying 
you know, this could be one very long, could have been one, a very long one. And what would I say? Well, there's only one thing. We've made our decision. So I feel like we're in a, how do you, how do you talk about it? Question. We did a chicken and egg problem, Mr. Chair. Not too many years ago, we had a chicken and egg problem with a 10-acre loophole. And the way to solve the 10-acre loophole was to change the law having to do with septic systems and septic system designs. And we weren't able to get over that hump. And we didn't give the department the authority to change septic systems because the representatives from Addison County screamed bloody murder because they got clay. So we directed the administration to come up with a plan to change septic systems and how do we change the law and bring them to the legislature. They brought them to us and we endorsed them. But they were not allowed to implement them and start them before we had endorsed them. And that was because the people in Addison County were just thought that that was, uh, you know, damn that they were going to give that. It was the legislature's job to do it. And that worked. We tried the same thing with uh, solar a few years ago. We asked the PDC to come up and give us a bunch of rules to give us you know, proposals on the 15th of January. And uh, they didn't do it. And then they used their authority that we gave the PUC in the event that the legislature dawdled with the January 15th report and didn't implement it in time to get the rules in place. And we gave them the authority to do it by rule in the event that we dawdled. And they went and did it by rule and never gave us the, the report. I don't trust them. Okay. And that's, and, and that's, you know, they should, if we're going to endorse a recommendation, we do it. We don't say you go out and decide what's going to happen and implement it. Well, okay, so I don't want to so that's get right. stuck here. That's my, uh, yeah. There's four no. criteria. Would you just pick, is, is, to satisfy the, um, where yeah. you're headed, I, would you pick one of these and eliminate three? Is that? I, in fairness to what you're trying to do here. I'm prepared to, to listen more to how we solve the problem of getting some things started today that we direct under our guidelines, knowing full well that the, the law that puts together a climate council and has 23 people in it who somehow have some voting rights um, that will probably not result in concrete action for three years. If there are other things that are being done in the interim, I'm listen, open to listening to what we've done in the interim. Well, I'm, I'm all for getting something done in, eight, in three years, that's for sure. Well, we're, we, we've stolen, we've taken money for 18 months to come up with a plan of what we're going to do, and I don't want to farm it out to the PUC um, before we before we've signed on. I don't want to have that being implemented and have uh, us go around to talk to our constituents and say, don't blame us, the PUC did PUC doesn't have to make an argument with the public. The PUC doesn't have to, to justify what it does. We do. Okay. Well, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I'm just not sensing that we're it's a tough putting problem. ourselves into that predicament. I mean, uh, you know, one other version of this is you could, it may already be covered in law. I don't know what the, if there's a reporting requirement for instance, you know, could say trust but verify. Uh, you know, I've seen enough things go on. I've had a different experience than you've had with some this. of the proceedings. So, uh, and especially as I listen to what we heard in here from the participants last week and, and the filings they had that were much more lengthy and detailed this summer and fall. There's already a lot of work been brought forward, so I'm myself. I'm sensing that it's a productive venue for us to work through, and as long as and I agree, we should provide sufficient guidance so that we're still owners of the policy. Yeah, I, I work, Mr. Chair. You're the chair's committee, and you are having yourself focused on a result that most of us here. Hardly embracing, and we're we're mincing words over how we get there. Okay. So let's let's 
forward. We'll move forward. We'll move forward. Yeah. Great. So, um, all right. So, in terms of uh, this draft, we tomorrow, uh, if people are looking at our schedule, uh, we're the department. So, we had a PUC report on Act 62, but um, happily enough, from from, I think, the legislature's point of view. Two years ago, we started down the path to having an annual energy report from the department, and uh, they have a, a longer and more sophisticated description of what it includes. But for me, it's, I call it the low-hanging fruit report in a way, because it helps us look at what's going on in Vermont uh, energy across the sectors. It helps us see what's going and how that matches up to things like the comprehensive energy plan. And the whole um, idea, when we requested it, starting two or three sessions ago, was that rather than have legislators come in and have to um, start from scratch each year, how about have a report that would bring us up to date and let us see the most cost-effective measures uh, that we already had, and we might add new measures, we might um, change funding for existing measures, but it would give us a place of uh, being well informed to work from. And so we'll get that report tomorrow morning. Uh, it also has an impact on these discussions about uh, this draft bill. Um, so there's a good nexus there as well. Um, meanwhile, I'd say. Uh, no one's really had time to study this bill, think it through. So I look to people in the room, if you have anything you would like, I'm going to ask everyone, all parties, including the committee, to read the bill, think about it, have discussions coming starting tomorrow to be able to work through it. It is concise. It's only two pages. Um, my goal is that by Friday, we'll have enough conversations, enough edits as a group, we'll feel comfortable uh, moving to the this thing by itself. Great. This thing by itself. We can do it. There's other things to do, uh, but there's no reason to uh, do wait for everything else to show up. We can walk, chew gum, skip rope, and a couple other things at once. Great. Thank you. Thanks for taking the lead on this, too. Okay. Um, so uh, before we adjourn, anyone want to put a question on the table, sort of a first impression here, something that I would want everyone to think about uh, before we adjourn? Uh, otherwise, we'll so let me pause there. Any takers? Senator McDonald's got something going for us. Anyone else? OK. I'm a very happy group, although you're expressing it subtle, super subtly. Um, uh, so with that, we are adjourned.